All right, hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a review, or at least making a start on my review, of The Four Dimensional Nightmare by J.G. Ballard. This is the uh, Penguin Science Fiction Edition. I guess I'll read you the blurb. Uh, Man abandoned in a dry, decaying world of automation. Earth brushed by the tentacles of civilizations from outer space. Time, music, poetry, beasts and flowers blossoming into new and garish forms. In these stories, the author of The Drowned World, tipped by Kingsley and me for the most imaginative of Wells' successors, gives warning of man's arid, tinkling destiny. For copyright reasons, this book is not for sale in the USA. Wow, okay. So the uh, stories in this, we have The Voices of Time, The Sound Sweep, Prima Belladonna, Studio 5, The Stars, The Garden of Time, The Cage of Sand, The Watchtowers, and Chronopolis. Um, so I'm going to take you through my tabs and then I'll give you my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So the first thing that I tabbed out was this in the Voices of Time, and mainly because it felt super relatable to me. Cauldron continues to reproach me, Powers wrote in his diary. For some reason he seems unwilling to accept his isolation, is, el is elaborating a series of private rituals to replace the missing hours of sleep. Perhaps I should tell him of my own approaching zero, but he'd probably regard this as his but he'd probably regard this as the final unbearable insult that I should have in excess what he so desperately yearns for. God knows what might happen. Fortunately, the nightmarish visions appear to have receded for the time being. Oh, I just thought this was interesting, and um, it almost reminded me actually of the architect in um, High Rise who lived at the top of the building, and kind of he'd earned that right or whatever through being the architect. Until his liaison with Coma, Cauldron lived alone in the old abstract summer house on the north side of the lake. This was a seven-storey folly originally built by an eccentric millionaire mathematician in the form of a spiralling concrete ribbon that wound round itself like an insane serpent, serving walls, floors and ceilings. Only, co only Cauldron had solved the building, a geometric, a geometric model of the square root of minus one, and consequently he had been able to take it off the agent's hands at a comparatively low rent. In the evenings, Powers had often watched him from the laboratory, striding restlessly from one level to the next, swinging through the labyrinth of inclines and terraces to the rooftop, where his lean, angular figure stood out like a gallows against the sky, his lonely eyes sifting out radio lanes for the next day's trapping. We get a reference as well to like a time measurement being, uh, where he says simply that it's been estimated that by the time this series reaches zero, the universe will have just ended. Then uh, Powers says, thoughtful of them to let us know what the real time is. Which is true. I mean, time is a construct, isn't it? I still don't understand why we celebrate New Year's Eve. It's not the end of a year, it's the end of a calendar. Whatever. No no, no one's celebrating this year anyway, are they? So we get this a little bit. In this story, uh, Studio 5, The Stars, it's very much a writery story. And uh, we get... As he drove off, I opened the letter. Inside was a single sheet of paper. Mr Ransom, your rejection of my poems astounds me. I seriously advise you to reconsider your decision. This is no trifling matter. I expect to see the poems printed in your next issue. Aurora a day. And he says, that night I had another insane dream. And uh, the kind of the point of this is that nobody really writes anymore because machines do it for us. So um, um, Aurora suggests that they just write some poetry themselves because the machines are broken down. And we get, Aurora, I snapped. You can't be serious. Listen, for heaven's sake, this is no joking. But she'd put the phone down. I turned to Tony Sapphire, then sat back limply and contemplated it and... Then sat back limply and contemplated an intact tape spool I had recovered from one of the sets. It looks as if I've had it. Did you hear that? Write some yourself. She must be insane, Tony agreed. It's all part of this tragic obsession of hers, I explained, lowering my voice. She genuinely believes she's the muse of poetry, returned to earth to re-inspire the dying race of poets. Last night she referred to the myth of Melanda and Corydon. I think she's seriously waiting for some, some. I think she's seriously waiting for some young poet to give his life for her. Tony nodded. She's missing the point though. Fifty years ago, a few people wrote poetry, but no one read it. Now no one writes it either. The VT set merely simplifies the whole process. And so this is that. I'm just actually flicking backwards here. I found where the tab that fell out was from. Uh, so this is that story that gets uh, referenced there as well. Have you ever heard the legend of Melanda and Corydon? She asked. Vaguely, I said, casting my mind back. Melanda was the muse of poetry, if I remember, the white goddess. Wasn't Corydon a court poet who killed himself for her? Good, Aurora told me. You're not completely illiterate, after all. Yes, the court poets found that they had lost their inspiration and that their ladies were spurning them for the company of the knights. So they sought out Melanda, the muse, who told them that she had brought this spell upon them because they had taken their art for granted, forgetting the source from whom it really came. 
They protested that of course they thought of her always, a blatant lie. But she refused to believe them and told them that they would not recover their power until one of them sacrificed his life for her. Naturally, none of them would do so, with the exception of a young poet of great talent called Corydon, who loved the goddess and was the only one to retain his power. For the other poet's sake, he killed himself. To Melanda's undying sorrow, I concluded. She was not expecting him to give his life for his art. A beautiful myth, I agreed, but I'm afraid you'll find no Corydon's here. I don't know if I'm saying that right. It looks like the word Croydon. So I just think this is quite an interesting little bit here. Um, uh, Ransom, what the hell are you talking about? I'm not a damned factory, I'm a poet. I write when I have something to say in the only suitable way to say it. Yes, yes, I rejoined. But I have 50 pages to fill and only a few days in which to do it. You've given me about 10, so you've just got to keep up the flow. What have you produced today? Well, I'm working on another sonnet, some nice things in it, to Aurora, her to Aurora herself, as a matter of fact. Great, I told him. But careful with those vocabulary selectors. Remember the golden rule. The, ide the ideal sentence is one word long. What else have you got? What else? Nothing. This is likely to take all week, perhaps all year. I nearly swallowed the phone. Tristram, what's the matter? For heaven's sake, haven't you paid the power bill or something? Have they cut you off? Before I could find out, however, he had rung off. One sonnet a day, I said to Tony. Good God, he must be on manual. Crazy idiot. He probably doesn't realise how complicated those circuits are. So um, this final uh, story, Chronopolis, basically follows like the land that time forgot in a way. They've almost, they're basically outlawed clocks and we have this uh, conversation. But what did you do with them, Mr. Crichton? Conrad pressed. Well, you just looked at them and you knew what time it was. One o'clock or two or half past seven. That was when I'd go off to work. But you go off to work now when you've had breakfast. And if you're late, the timer rings. Crichton shook his head. I can't explain it to you, lad. You ask your father. But Mr. Newman was hardly more helpful. The explanation promised for Comrade's 16th birthday never materialised. When his questions persisted, Mr. Newman, tired of sidestepping, shut him up with an abrupt, just stop thinking about it. Do you understand? You'll get, the rest, you'll get yourself and the rest of us into a lot of trouble. And then uh, he ends up getting sent to jail and um, it turns out the law's a bit different in jail and they have to have a clock um, because it kind of forces the prisoners to keep track of time. And um, he's like really happy because he loves time. Uh, but then it, we get the ending. He was still chuckling over the absurdity of it all two weeks later when for the first time he noticed the clock's insanely irritating tick. Anyway, that's pretty much all I've got for you for The Four Dimensional Nightmare by J.G. Ballard. Overall, I did enjoy this. I would give this a pretty solid 3.75, maybe even a 4 out of 5. High Rise is definitely my favourite of the books of his that I've read so far. Uh, this comes second, but I've only read two. But I'll definitely be reading more. And um, this makes me think that Ballard could well be one of my new favourite authors. So there we have it, that's what I thought of The Four Dimensional Nightmare by J.G. Ballard. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.